What's up guys and welcome back to another episode of Headphones Neil Reviews. I'm your host as always, Headphones Neil, bringing you a kind of hodgepodge reviews of sort for this week just because where I'm at on all three uh, reviews are actually about, uh, well I want to say for one, two of them it's about halfway through, technically halfway through for the show, um, almost done with another show, and then about a third of the way through the game that I'm currently playing. So with that I'll go into all of those reviews where I'm at, my initial thoughts on, or kind of my thoughts where I'm at at the moment for all of those items. And then round it out with a retrospective on the Android phones I've used over the years and kind of why I've settled on what I've settled at. Um, that came kind of out of a discussion with a friend of mine who asked why I don't really talk about, you know, roaming and rooting my Android smartphone, why I don't really visit those forums anymore and things like that because we we're talking about, you know, repurposing an old cell phone and having to do research and why my knowledge of that stuff is kind of rusty and not up to par for where it is. So I thought I would share some of my thoughts and process of, processes of my history of cell phones and kind of why I've over the years moved away from rooting and roaming and kind of why, not to say that it's a bad thing, but why I've generally just moved away from it and why I use the phone that I do. So to start off with my um, general reviews, um, I decided I would start watching Fear the Walking Dead Season 7 because Season 8, the final season of the show, is going to be starting soon. I believe in May of this year, so I thought I would catch up, see where all of the stars of the show are at, what's going on, what the story's about. Um, I do listen to the podcast, um, The Talking Dead, not the official one but from AMC, but a separate one that's been around for much longer, so I've, I'm kind of up to date on the story. I heard kind of mixed things about that season, so it was kind of on par for where the rest of the seasons were at. So, um, But because I know what's going on generally, I thought, you know what, I'm going to finish it, be a completionist, and see where we're at. So over this co the course of the first half of the season, so I've gotten through the first eight episodes, um, everyone is trying to figure out what, um, who this Padre is, what he's all about, why is everyone trying to look for him, so it's an interesting mystery. Um, we do have all of our heroes separated all over the place. We have Strand um, running his own little um, oasis, paradise, um, just his own little area of sorts, kind of to have a sanctuary um, that he um, acts as a gatekeeper for, but also the leader. So it's kind of, if you think along the lines of a more strict version of any one of the areas from like a Mad Max movie. So... Um, if you think of one of those areas, that's kind of what Strand is doing, but kind of an all-purpose, um, self-functioning unit. So, um, there's that, but then everyone is still mad at him about the way he's doing things, even though he's trying to argue that his way is better because it's working and that he's doing what needs to be done. But, um, the characters like Morgan and Alicia are still mad at him for the things he's done in the past. Um, but by the time we get to the middle of the season, we learn that, um... Alicia has a virus which she's trying to overcome. She may not survive it, but they're also already still looking, still looking for Padre. She thinks it, or from what I gather, she thinks it's a um, location or area or something, maybe an acronym of sorts, like a actual location. Whereas everyone else thinks that um, Padre is a person, so we'll see um, who that is. And uh, the whole time I was thinking that it was an old guy from the last season, but I haven't actually gone back to see. Um, if that is the same person or not. So we'll see how the rest of the season pans itself out. But so far, I'm actually enjoying the season. Um, episode over episode, it actually seems interesting how they're handling things, but I could also see why watching it over episode after over episode, week after week, with that week in between episodes would be a problem because they're all... So far, generally isolated episodes until you get to episodes like 7 and 8. So it's kind of weird. So I'm starting to think if the show actually benefits from being watched after the fact, um, all in succession as a binge watch rather than a weekly um, update. So we'll see how the rest of the season goes. There's still enough episodes to say that it takes a turn for the worst, but uh, we shall see. But overall, so far, I'm liking the season. It is actually one of the better seasons, I want to say, but 
um, previously, I know I thought, I may have, may have said it, I don't remember offhand, where um, episodes are good, the season starts good, but then it ends uh, weak, it's inconsistent in what it's doing, so we'll see how that goes. So with that being said, um, I have watched the latest episode of The Mandalorian, so season 3, episode 6, Guns for Hire, so we actually finally catch up with what the uh, Rogue Mandalorian fleet has been up to, the one that took the fleet that was stolen from Bo-Katan because she wasn't able to keep the Darksaber, so uh, we learned that they've actually have been working as mercenaries, they're currently protecting this random planet, and essentially the episode is a means and a setup for Bo-Katan and uh, Din Djarin to recover the fleet and make Bo-Katan the leader. You could say on a technicality, but um, Din provides a good reasoning for why she um, should be the leader based on her actual actions. So because he's witness to what she did and because she saved him using the Darksaber, and protected him that makes her legitimately the ruler and makes her the leader of the Mandalorians yet again. So while that was the smallest part of the episode it actually was set up very nicely because we have special cameos from Christopher Lloyd, Jack Black, and I guess Lizzo. Um, I actually don't listen to her music and I couldn't tell her uh, spot her out of a crowd as a singer. I know of her but I don't know much about her beyond that so that's why I was like, she might be important, she could be an actress, I didn't know any different, but reading after the fact who she was, I was like, okay, yeah, now I know who she is, but it was nice to see those cameos, the episode overall was good, it was interesting to see this, oa uh, this um, another oasis of sorts where you have ex-imperial um, officers running this town, working for, uh, as part of the um, New Republic's um, program to rehabilitate all these Imperial officers and now that they're running this place or ha they have droids they don't have weapons and things like that so all the rules that are in place but they're actually making an interesting effort to rebuild their lives with the New Republic in a positive way so all of that was good um, it was a nice touch to have Din telling Bo-Katan about why this is why he doesn't trust droids because of how easy they are to be corrupted and all that so um, it essentially turned into a lightweight police episode. Not necessarily like a Columbo or like any other cop show, but um, it was kind of a mix of things. But it was, that was all essentially a setup to have Bo and Din meet up with a Mandalorian fleet, make Bo the leader again, and get the fleet back under her command as part of the attempt to reclaim Mandalore. So. It feels like the season finale next week is actually going to be a very action-packed episode. I haven't seen, or I, I don't know if it's been so, uh, leaked yet or not for how long the season finale is going to be, but I anticipate if they are going to show the retaking of Mandalore or the attempt at retaking of Mandalore that it's going to be a very action-packed episode and, inf and packed with information as far as who those TIE fighters are, who those fleet, who that fleet belongs to, a potential Thrawn cameo, maybe even a Star Wars Rebels connection with Hera Syndulla and the rest of them. Um, maybe her son, if the rumors are to be um, believed, the actual taking of Mandalore by the Mandalorians and all of that. So essentially this is that continued setup for the retaking of Mandalore. So my final thought is that they're going to round out the season with that attack and we're going to get the final fate of what happens with them either they're going to win and um we're going to find out about maybe thrawn and gideon or the mandalorian mandalorians are finally going to be defeated once and for all which is why we don't see them or haven't seen them as of yet in places like the sequel trilogy or no real mention of it that's uh, popped up over time over all these years since the old content became legends but um i'm suspecting that the mandalorians are going to be defeated because we're going to have someone like thrawn leading the attack and defeating them it was all part of his master plan to get them to come together attack man try to attack mandalore and retake it and come to their ultimate um defeat so there's that and then i know my early prediction was we're going to get something related to emperor palpatine or 
a Sith tomb or something like that. So I'm still holding hope for that, but we shall see. I don't think that that's going to actually happen. So with that being said, and with the talk of um, Imperials converting to the Republic, um, last week I started playing Battlefront 2's campaign mode. Um, this is Battlefront 2 from 2017. So I restarted my Xbox Game Pass subscription. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to give the game a shot, see how the streaming goes, make sure it still works. I know I was having trouble with um, GoldenEye with the streaming and stuff. Um, I still have a little bit of issue. Every so often it'll get sluggish and have bandwidth issues, but for the most part, it actually has been working very, very smoothly. So I've been playing the campaign mode. Um, it follows Inferno Squad as they're um, trying to ensure the... Um, Empire's victory at the Battle of Endor. They have their downfall. And I've gotten to the point in the story where, um, and I always forget the main, late, the commander lady's name, uh, Versio, or is her last name, I think. Um, she's now defecting from the Empire because she's now learning that Pro Operation Cinder is going to be used on um, Imperials and non Imperials alike. So her subordinate guy gets promoted uh, for following the Admiral's orders. But essentially, she's defecting to the New Republic because she doesn't want... Or this isn't the um, empire that she signed up for, that they should still protect their own people at the very least and not protect people who don't follow their order and rules and all of that sort of stuff. So overall, it's actually a very, very interesting story, and I'm really, actually really interested in it, so I enjoy playing all the different levels. Um, for the most part, there so far, they've actually been pretty straightforward and short, um episodes and levels and things like that so you don't see uh, too many of what i too many videos of what i usually do where i have you know multiple parts the first couple i did just because i was getting used to it and then of course the flight over the or the uh, flight fighting stuff over the dog fighting over the battle of endor was a little bit difficult probably because of the wreckage and I always have trouble with the up is down and down is up controls uh, setup. I thought I had flipped it, but it's not quite working as um, how I expected. But the, the flight battle that happened afterwards was actually a lot easier because there was less debris, more room to maneuver and all of that stuff. So we'll see about that. It looks like there's going to be, a, based on where I'm at, that there's going to be another battle with X-Wing. So hopefully that goes a lot even more smoothly based on learning curves but overall the story is very interesting in that we're following this group of imperials we're connecting some of those dots as far as what happened after the battle of endor but from an imperial point of view so if you're like me and still haven't played it after all this time then i do definitely recommend checking it out because it is an interesting game the graphics are beautiful um, so in this Knights of the Old Republic remake that I, they, you know, was, that people was being worked on and supposedly may have fizzled out, but I kind of hope they kind of follow the visual cues from this game because it actually reminded me a lot of that where, um, Battlefront 2's graphics seemed like they took what they saw in Knights of the Old Republic and scaled it up, fixed it up, added the, you know, more colors and depth and realism to it and all of that, so... Um, I can see why Knights of the Old Republic has a high bar to um, jump over in order to get made and be a good game, or as good of a game as people remember, but um, I'll have a link in the show notes to the gameplay that I have on for Battlefront 2. It's up on my YouTube channel, um, youtube.com slash PatelN01, um, so you can kind of follow along, but overall it's a good game. Um, I'm enjoying, like I said, the story is very good. I'm enjoying following just this one set of characters through and through. It was nice to see Luke Skywalker and R2-D2 in a random um, point, uh, from a, a random point of view and on a random planet and to control them. So I hope we see them soon. Uh, we just got, or I just saw that we had General Calrissian in there. So I'm hoping we get a little bit more of them or more of their connecting tissue as far as um, how they deal with this particular, how they deal with Inferno Squad's um, story arc, redemption, um, if they stay with the New Republic, go back to the Empire, or find out what all happens with all of that. I'm kind of out in the dark as far as what happens in the campaign mode. I might have read it a while ago, but I'll, I'm also trying not to read too much online as far as what the game is about, the story, 
Operation Cinder and all that so I can stay in the dark and all the reveals that need to happen get revealed appropriately. So things like the Emperor dying, we knew about that. And I could have sworn I vaguely remember something about that little droid thing that comes active when the Empire Emperor dies to talk about, to enact and start Operation Cinder. So I remember seeing something about that, but I didn't have any context for it. So now that I do, it's good to have more perspective on it. So overall, I recommend the game so far. So I'm going to continue playing that and you'll see regular updates until I'm done with the game up on the YouTube channel. So with that being said, I'm going to round out the episode with my history of cell Android smartphones that I've used. Um, over the years, I have used other devices like iPhones, test drove Windows phones, and things like that. But I've always come back to Android because at the base level, it's customizable. I can set up my home screen exactly how I want. If I don't like it, I can switch to something else. I can make my Android phone look like iOS or Windows phone and all of that. So things like that have always kept me coming back. And using iPhones and Windows phones, I've never had anything wrong with them. But if you're not really into that whole tinkering mindset or you don't really care about how your phone is customized aside from, you know, your wallpaper and arrangement of icons, then all phones are essentially the same. So it's no judgment for me as far as which brand you use. They all do things relatively equally, it just depends on what is easier for the user because everybody's a little bit different. So for me, my first Android smartphone was the Samsung Captivate. Um, I bought that at the time uh, for my first smartphone because it was either between that and uh, I think there were whatever the iPhone 3 or 4 was at the time. This was still when the iPhones were like three and a half inches or 3.4 inches big or something like that. So the Samsung Captivate seemed large by comparison. It was like 4.4 .4 inches or 4.1 inches large. So I was like, I was on AT&T at the time. So I went with that model. This was back when Samsung was um, selling different models of its same phone based on character. So it was like the Captivate for AT&T and whatever else they had for Verizon and T-Mobile and Sprint. And, like, I don't, and I'm kind of exaggerating there, but each carrier had its own different model of the same phone. But um, I saw commercials, I read the specs, I really liked it. So overall, I like the phones and the phone and the spec, but the one thing that's turned me off to Samsung phones over the years has always been their software. Um, even trying the Galaxy S23 now, I didn't. I don't like that there's all the extra stuff they put on top of the Android system. I don't say that it's a bad thing because there are people who use it and like it and like all their software are, and are invested in it. But for me, I'm just a plain Jane Android user, stock launcher, maybe even use Nova Launcher and have things to customize it from there. I don't need extra layers of stuff that I can't get rid of. So this, so right from the bat, as soon as I could install a custom ROM on the Samsung Captivate, I did. This was back when, um, so currently the ROM of choice for changing your phone's um, software from its whatever stock software is, is Lineage OS. But before that, it was called CyanogenMod. So as soon as CyanogenMod was available for my Samsung Captivate, I put it on there, got rid of all the Samsung stuff, one of the first things I noticed was a performance up increase, but also a battery life increase because I was getting about four to five hours, which is not bad for the time. Um, but by switching over to CyanogenMod, I was able to increase that up to seven to eight hours, sometimes a little bit more, you know, 30 minutes or so here and there. Just, you know, if I was in meetings and wasn't using it for much, uh, I forgot it at home or something and things like that. So seven to eight hours in my general guidelines. So... Um, from there on out, it was one of those things where if I could get away with not having a phone with that extra hardware, then, you know, great, I'll go with it. But from there, installing CyanogenMod was, I always recommended um, either going with a Google Nexus phone, I think it was at the time, or buying a flagship phone so you could replace the software with CyanogenMod and ha still have great hardware, but have good software that's not bogging down your system and, pres and helping to preserve your battery life. So from there, at some point, my phone was getting old, slowing down. Um, I think the updates to CyanogenMod were slowing down, so around Android 
four or five, something like that. So it was showing his, his age, it was getting fewer and fewer updates. So um, by chance, or I think I had enough points on my credit card, I thought I would get the Amazon Fire Phone. So the reason I went with that, because their promise or their premise of, um, you know, kind of 3D look and feel, um, is their hardware jumps up at you, is backed by the Amazon Play, um, App Store and all that. So the specs were nice, the uh, visuals were nice and all of that for the time. But I ran into the same issue I had with the Samsung Captivate where, they, or a similar situation I'll say, where the hardware was nice, but the software wasn't really kept up to date. It was a couple of versions of Android behind, so you weren't really getting the latest and greatest features. There wasn't, they didn't really, they kind of went um, out of the gate really hard, but they kind of slowed down after that. I guess adoption didn't go as fast as they can, so. Uh, with my luck, I didn't have to wait nearly as long as I had to with the Samsung Captivate. So um, I think this was right around the time when CyanogenMod was switching to Lineage OS. So I forget which one I actually used on that phone, but as soon as I could put get rid of Amazon stuff, I did. And it was a marginal improvement, but it was essentially an easy way to get rid of all of Amazon stuff and just have stock Android. So, you know, I had the camera and I was able to use all the apps straight from the Google Play Store. Um, and overall, it was good stuff. Um, it was a good phone um, and e relatively easy to get rid of Amazon stuff to just have stock Android and go from there. But um, still one of those things where um, good hardware, okay specs, but needed more investment from Amazon. So from here on out, um, but the, so with the Amazon Fire Phone, once that um, was on the downturn, it wasn't getting much updates and then I dropped it and cracked the screen. So it's still kind of functional, but I thought, you know what, it's about time for me to get a new phone. So um, I started researching around and one of the brands that I never really got behind because it was brand new and wasn't sure about, but by the time we got to this model, I was like, okay, they've been around long enough. They have a good track record. They have a lot of good um, feedback and support behind it, behind the company. So I thought, you know what, I'm gonna go for the OnePlus 3. But then in reading, I learned that they have this on-off cycle or they were starting this on-off cycle of a uh, numbered release early in the year, then a, a T model later where they refresh the specs and kind of update it for later in the year. So you know, um, the OnePlus 3 might have, you know, a certain processor, but then later in the year, they'll put a newer processor in the 3T, kind of refresh, maybe bump the RAM a little bit and th um, things like that. And if there's a new version of Android, include that, things like that. But also it has a, as close to stock Android as you can get without being an actual Google device. So I bought the OnePlus 3T, um, unlocked straight from OnePlus, no carrier involvement at all. And I wanna say that's one of the best purchases I made as far as cell phone goes, just because they were, they, um, had regular updates for the devices. It was very timely. I didn't have to wait for carrier updates. But most importantly, I didn't have to get rid of their software to install a custom ROM. Everything was as was really close to stock Android. The launcher supported. Actually, I forget if the stock launcher supported iCompacts at the time. I think they did, but I'm only about 85% sure. So I'm pretty sure they supported iCompacts and things. But I didn't have to go out of my way to get rid of stuff, change stuff, add stuff. I could use the phone right um, out of the box to um, as I wanted without having to jump through any hoops. They had a nice shelf to hide widgets and apps and things like that. So it was a great device. It was powerful in its first time. It had a great camera and it performed really well. It was really stable. So I want to say uh, all day battery life for the time. So maybe nine to ten hours or so um a little bit less if you use it all day how use the camera a lot and stuff like that but overall a very solid phone still one of my favorite uh phones for now even still now um size for now seems kind of small but it was actually big for the size so um for me i i recommend i start this was the start of my love for the oneplus brand because the phone was very well done um, so come a couple years later, um, I think the phone, I don't remember why I decided I wanted to upgrade. It might've been a couple of years. I, 
the phone might have been starting to feel a little bit small or something like that, but the OnePlus 5T had just come out. And I actually kind of like the specs. It was a little bit bigger than the 3T, which is why I say the screen size. The specs were newer enough. Um, there was not too much else that really was changed. Um, Hardware-wise, of course, you're going to have spec bumps and things like that. But in general, if you had the 3T, then going to the 5T was not a big jump. But I was like, you know what? It's about time. Um, I got... I think I had some extra money lying around, so I was like, you know what, okay, I'll buy it. It's still reasonably priced. Um, so I ended up buying the 5T. Nothing too special to say about it. It's a good phone. I like the fingerprint sensor on the back. Um, but overall, if you like the 3T, then you would like the 5T. It's basically the same phone with newer specs and a slightly bigger screen. So um, with that, um, that's kind of why I kept that for a really long time. And I did actually did not upgrade until the OnePlus 8 Pro came out, just because it had 5G. Out my the phone was now a few years old; it was starting to show its age. I think they were talking about not supporting it anymore. I, it just it was going to soon receive its final updates. So I was like, "All right, well, it's time for 5G. There's enough of a spec bump, so I might as well give it a shot." So I went with the OnePlus 8 Pro. Overall, it's a decent phone. It's kind of the last phone in the line of traditional OnePlus phones. Um, because from Android 12 is kind of where OnePlus started merging with um, Oppo. Um, but they've st since then, they started going back to a more traditional OnePlus. So it's one of those things where it's the last in the for me in the line of the traditional OnePlus devices. So they kind of introduced 5G. They didn't have, this was before the Hasselblad. Um, partnership and all of that. A pretty solid phone, no complaints. Um, but I did upgrade to the OnePlus 9 Pro because of the partnership with Hasselblad. They were going to focus on uh, camera updates and performance and all of that. So I did make that upgrade, got rid of the 8 Pro, um, sold it off, so I kind of got a discount on the 9 Pro. But the mistake I made there was I went with the carrier and thinking that the carrier that I was on at the time um, supposedly they had a good um, history of you know phone updates and things like that so I was like okay well if that's what if that's the case then I'll go with the OnePlus 9 Pro with them I was saving a little bit money versus uh, buying it unlocked but the carrier was actually no different than any other carrier so um, it's I fell into that trap I guess that carriers are not as good or I mean I understand the process of why they wanted to check for updates before they roll them out but then you're a few updates behind and then there was a update to add the expand mode to the camera which didn't happen for months later and I was just really turned off by their whole update process they were good you know for the first few months but then like six months later it was you know they moved from almost once a month to once every few months so it was like okay well as soon as I can get rid of the phone I will um, and then it was also constantly plagued with a bug with Gmail or emails wouldn't sync. It would sometimes show a notification, sometimes not. So in general, it was not, I was just generally displeased with it. So I thought that, okay, once the next OnePlus phone comes out, then I'm going to um, upgrade the phone, get rid of this 9 Pro. I really don't want it. I'm going to get rid of it. So I sold it off, bought the OnePlus 10 Pro, which essentially is the newer one the oneplus 10 pro is essentially a new oneplus 9 pro they still have the hasselblad uh, partnership you have the wireless charging but, but then you have the usual thing of updated specs and newer features the gmail bug was gone so email seen properly but i also did buy the phone unlocked from oneplus so i'm getting the updates regularly i'm happy with that and the phone is actually really really well done and well made i'm overall happy with it to the point where I'm actually not upgrading to the OnePlus 11 because the 11 doesn't have wireless charging, but the price point is a little bit better. So it's not to say the OnePlus 11 is a bad phone. It actually looks pretty cool. And, you know, I love having the latest and greatest, but the OnePlus 10 Pro is actually a really, really solid phone. <coughs> and it still fall and they still overall follow the principles of having as close to a stock Android launcher as possible. The only thing that I kind of don't like is how they're updating their launcher to focus more on having the Google Discover feed when you swipe right versus the shelf, which you can have now by swiping down on the top right corner of the phone, 
which I actually don't like because you know that's it's a big phone and you actually have to either use your hand, adjust the phone to move your thumb to the from the top to the bottom of the screen or use your other hand so in my case I'm left-handed um, so I'm holding the phone with my left hand uh, using my thumb to navigate around and all of that so then I have to use my other hand to fold that scroll down on the shelf and all that and then it's limited to only certain widgets so it's a really strange launcher which I kind of don't like so in general if you don't use any of that stuff you're okay if everything's on your home screen with widgets and shortcuts and all of that you're fine but once you start getting into that whole thing of customization um, icon packs and all of that is fine but it's just ha you know hiding your widgets like you used to and I'm gonna I know I'm gonna say you know pull my old man card here but I like the way that the OnePlus 3T and 5T used to do it I forget now if the 8 Pro did it or not, but I really like the launcher on the OnePlus 3T and 5T. So, um, look, I want to say last week or the week before, I mentioned a launcher called O Launcher and Pro Launcher. So, Pro Launcher in the Google Play Store actually handles it very well and is very reminiscent of those old launchers from the OnePlus 3T and 5T, where you have a simple minimal home screen with your text and app shortcuts and stuff, but and then you can swipe right to have your widgets. And then push your back arrows or swipe uh, left to hide them again. So uh, one of the things that's made the OnePlus 10 Pro good again for me, as far as the launcher goes, is being able to use Pro Launcher to have this setup that was that makes the home screen look and feel like the old OnePlus 3T and 5T. So um, since I've been using the OnePlus devices. Uh, and it's not to say that I haven't tried installing custom ROMs on the OnePlus 3T and 5T, but I actually haven't needed to. I, the camera is great, the software is great, it's not intrusive. Overall, I get really, really good battery life that installing a custom ROM doesn't necessarily add any benefit to. It does get rid of all of OnePlus' stuff, but the battery life is about the same. Software ends up being pretty much the same, but you do end up losing a certain... OnePlus features so like in the camera on the OnePlus 10 Pro you do have things like the X-Pan mode um, you have a long exposure mode and things like that so you have good uh, camera functions that are tied into the sensors they take really good photographs on par with the you know Google camera the Samsung camera and all of that but um, installing the ROM doesn't necessarily change anything beyond that and then also um, things like a long screenshot or a scrolling screenshot. So let's say you're on a website <coughs> with a long post and you want all of it in one screenshot, you don't have to actually add another or install another app to be able to take that long screenshot. OnePlus has that built into the software. So you take your screenshot, you push the scroll button, you can let it scroll to the end of the page and then hit done or even hit done as it's scrolling for when to stop and you're done. And then the final thing with the OnePlus phones is that they've always come built, um, or at least since the 3T, they've come with a built-in screen recorder <coughs> that lets you record your um, home screen, games, apps, except for video streaming apps, and then record the audio that comes from those, like the games, or um, your voice, or do both at the same time. So all the gameplay videos that you see are recorded, or for the most yeah, actually, I don't think I've done many desktop game streaming since I stopped playing um, The Old Republic. But for the most part, all my gameplay videos are from my uh, phone. So um, you can see the quality change from the you know, Amazon Fire phone, which I think recorded at like 720p or something like that, maybe 1080p. But the screen recorders that come with the OnePlus phone, they used to record up to 4K and 60 frames per second. With recent updates, they've gone down to 2K and 60 frames per second, which is still good. But um, overall, they're very, very good phones for things like that. So you can, you know, do app reviews, share your home screen, what it looks like in a video form, record gameplay videos if, um, for sharing to YouTube. It does. It is really easy to record the gameplay with the sound, with your voiceover if you want, and then put it up on places like YouTube. Um, with Twitch, it's kind of weird that it doesn't have, they don't let you do that anymore, I guess, but because YouTube makes it really easy to upload videos, that's one of the reasons why I continue to use YouTube for um, my videos is that they make it really easy. So 
Um, because of that, that's kind of why I'm I'm not necessarily recommending everyone go out and buy a OnePlus phone today, but um, since I started buying OnePlus phones, that's why I moved away from having to root and ROM my phone because they make it really easy to change out my home screen, launcher, and all of that while still having a stock Android looking UI similar to the Google Pixels and uh, previously the Google Nexus, but having better hardware than those devices. And then same thing on the flip side, um, think of a, a Samsung phone uh, and uh, having all of the hardware, but not having any of the Samsung software installed. And that's where you get, that's what you get with a OnePlus device. So um, not to say that they don't have other, their own stuff uh, installed on the, on the um, phone, but they make it generally easy to disable that. They're not intrusive or anything like that. <coughs> so um, when you're using the phone, that's why I kind of stuck with them. I moved away from the rooting and roaming. So, um, with that being said, I am working on a idea for, a, for my future reviews as far as home screen customizations in the current state of Android, kind of a 2023 look at customizing your home screen. So, uh, look out for that coming soon. But that is actually all for this particular episode of Headphones Neil Reviews. So if you have any questions, comments, feedback, uh, suggestions on things to review or watch, all the links to the social media networks I'm on are on the website at headphonesneal.reviews. Link will be in the show notes. Um, which all, And the website also has links to support the show, uh, subscription options, past episodes, and all of that good stuff. Um, I'll have a link in the show notes as well to the gameplay playlist for Battlefront 2 so you can check out the levels that I've already completed and then if you subscribe there and hit the bell you'll get the notifications every time a new video is posted there whether it's a gameplay video or just any other video I put up on the channel. That's headphonesneal.reviews. But thanks for tuning into this particular episode and being a supporter and subscriber to the show and until next time.